This morning, I have the distinct pleasure to continue in a series that Gary has titled Shiloh Road. If you're new to Shiloh or if you've been going here for years, or maybe this is even your very first time being here, I think this is an awesome series, and I think this is an awesome lesson that I get the privilege of bringing to you today. In this series, we've gone over a number of things. The first one, it's, we call these our core values. The first one is that we want to pursue God together. Next, we want to make sure that we understand as a group that people matter. Also, we want to be people that invest and invite in people. We invest in others and we invite them to join us in this mission together. And also, we want to be about circles, not rows. If you were here last week or if you saw that online, Gary had an awesome message about that. This week, I get to talk about something I personally love. Before I forget, you know, last week, if you saw Gary's message, you know that he, he had a great message about small groups, essentially. Some of you may not have signed up yet for a small group. I want to encourage you to do so, and there's a little bit of a caveat that I need to share with you, and that is it's okay to sign up for more than one group. Some of the groups are specialty groups, including the one uh, that Leonard Ken is a part of leading. That group's actually starting tonight here at the building at 5 o'clock if you want to join them for that. But you can be a part of multiple groups. Today, I'm talking about something a little bit outside of ourselves. You see, the reason we have all these core values is because, ultimately, we want to be a church that by 2030 is a church that exalts Christ, encourages one another, and engages our neighbor. Those first two, I can tell you that most churches in America get right, and we get it right really well, especially here in the South. We do a really good job of exalting Christ and, and praising God together. We do a wonderful job of encouraging one another, usually with food, right? But for whatever reason, that third part, the engage your neighbor part, I like to say is a lot like the Holy Spirit. We tend to forget about it. And if I'm being honest with you, if we are going to be a church that engages our neighbor well, boy, do we need the work of the Holy Spirit. This morning, I get to talk to you about a core value of ours called seeing needs, meeting needs. Seeing needs and meeting needs. For those of you who don't know, I came from a little town called Winsboro, Texas, before I came here. It's where I was working as a youth minister. And some of you may know, uh, uh, some of you may realize he used to be a little boy, but he's a lot taller now. It, Zach Spear was a, a member here for a number of years. You all may know Ron and Trish. Zach was one of my best friends from Camp Deeron, and we never went to the same college together. We were never roommates in college together, but by the time we were about 24, 25 years old, I was living in Winsboro, and he got a job out at Camp Deeron, and he had the opportunity to come live with me. And so we're two single bachelor guys just hanging out in Winsboro, and if I'm being honest, sometimes it got a little messy around the house, as you can imagine. And if I'm being completely honest, my house was a little bit messy before Zach moved in. So Zach comes, and just don't tell Kenzie, but I wasn't as clean and tidy as I am now. Uh, back then. Zach comes in, and, you know, the same thing keeps on happening. There's this thing, what do you call it? Oh, yeah, sink. And, and the sink tends to always fill up just about every week for some reason. And it doesn't fill up with anything like water or soap. It usually fills up with dishes. And it often looks like this, right? Do we have a picture of that? There it is. It often looks like that. That's not our actual dishes. So, Zach, one day he comes to me and he says, Kyle, we got to do something about the dishes. And if I'm being completely honest, the dishes are about 95% mine because Zach has this crazy thing where he, he calls it his water cup. And it's literally, he has one cup in the house and he, he only drinks water out of it. And that's his dishes for the week. And so, the rest are mine. <laughs> and so, this, this day that Zach comes and talks to me, he says, Kyle, we got to do something about these dishes. Maybe him starting to date his now wife, Meredith, had something to do with it and her coming over and all that. But Zach said something that would change my life that day. He said, we got to make it a point to when we see it, do it. And not just dishes, but with dirty laundry or even clean laundry that sits on the couch until you wear it and wash it again, right? Or even yard work 
or sweeping or mopping, right? Gentlemen, if, if these are foreign words, just ask your spouse. If you see it, do it. And the reason that it changed my life is because ultimately I had a new motto to live by. That whenever I see that need, I need to meet it in the moment because that small thing tends to grow. We understand this idea maybe in a little bit different terms. You've probably heard the phrase, how do you eat an elephant? Well, one bite at a time. How do we get to all the things that stack up around us? When we see it, we need to do it. Seeing needs and meeting needs is something that we all understand internally about the things around us, about our own lives. We see the needs around us, and sometimes we need to ask for help for those. But even as a society, we understand this idea that when we see a need, we need to meet it. Uh, Not long ago, there was a Houston Cougars basketball player who was playing against Alabama, which, if you didn't know, Alabama is a massive university, and Houston is not quite as massive. But they were playing in a basketball game, and it came down to the very end, and Alabama beat them by one point. And I'll tell you, whenever I researched this story, uh, Alabama fans are kind of rude after they win. And they're ruthless, and they start chanting at them, and they say, we just beat you, and they let them know it. And so these Houston Cougars team, this Houston Cougar team, did I say Cougar? (laughs) Houston Cougar team, there's an assistant coach that as he's walking through the tunnel to the locker room, he kicks a chair and throws another one. And another player follows suit by taking a trash can and sliding it and throwing it up against the wall behind him, letting trash just lay out everywhere. And as they go into the locker room, other players are following suit destroying things as they go, making a mess for somebody else to deal with. That is until and except for one starting guard named Jamal Shedd. And he kind of went viral for a video of what he did. Let's watch and see what he chose to do instead of following suit. if y'all could hear it, but somebody yells out there, thank you, sir. Why does a video like this go viral? He's just picking up trash, right? It's not that hard. It's a very little thing to do. I think it goes viral because it isn't the sort of behavior that people have come to expect in our society. This young man was following after his team that's on his side. And he's in a stadium full of people who are letting them know that they are not on their side. But he recognizes something. That that small thing of a bunch of trash in that aisle way, that's going to become somebody else's problem. He saw the need and he chose to meet it. Because Jamal understood that the little things always become big things. The little things always become big things because he knew that what his team did was wrong and he knew that their actions would impact others that they don't even know. He also knew that someone else was going to have to clean it up even though the people that he was choosing to help were supposed to be his enemy. This is why it went viral. Because somebody, for once, chose that they were going to see needs and meet them. As Christians, we ought to understand this idea really well. If you have a Bible, let's turn to Acts chapter 14. Or pull out your phone or iPad, whatever it is. Isn't technology crazy? You can literally pull up like hundreds and 
thousands of translations. My college minister used to use the one that's like Samoan language. <laughs> it was really funny. In Acts chapter 14, we have two followers of Jesus named Paul and Barnabas who are on a journey. And their journey is to go and to preach, to teach, and to heal. And as they're going, they're, they're headed through this country, this space, this town called Lystra, and they're on their way to Derby. They're just passing through, maybe going to stop for a night or two, see if they can't tell others about Jesus and the good news of him. And let's read starting in verse 8. In Lystra there sat a man who was lame. It doesn't mean he was uncool, it meant he couldn't walk. He had been that way from birth and he had never walked. Let's stop and think about that for a second. Could you imagine what this man had been through in his life? From the moment he was born, he was never able to do what all of us probably take for granted each and every day. The ability to get up and walk. And everybody else in town knew it. Because I would imagine most people tended to have to help him. Because he couldn't do things for himself. If you're looking to meet a need, I would say this is a pretty big one, right? But let's keep reading. Verse 9, he listens to Paul as he was, he listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed. Let's stop for a second there too. Notice that Paul doesn't just see him and then avert his eyes like probably everybody else in his life. It says that Paul looked directly at him and he saw him. And he looked directly at him and he saw him. He saw that he had a need that could be met because of his faith to be healed. And so then Paul doesn't just stop there. Because ultimately the, the most important thing for us to realize about this story and about this entire message today is this, that seeing the need is only the beginning. I bet if we were to take a tally and just give everybody a sheet of paper in here, you could probably come up with a laundry list of things that you've seen this week alone, of needs out in the real world in your life and other people's lives that are going unmet. We do a really good job of seeing the need, right? But the sad reality is for most of us, we see the need and then we go and we talk about it. You say, did you see that guy? God bless him, right? We see a need, and we go and we share it on Facebook. Just this morning, we brought up an a cappella song called Everybody Said That Anybody Could Do, The Important Things That Somebody Should Do. Everybody said that anybody could do all the good things that nobody did. Seeing the need is only the beginning. Paul knew that. Let's keep reading verse 10. So Paul saw that he had faith to be healed and called out, Stand up on your feet. And at that, the man jumped up and began to walk. Hold on. You're telling me that this guy who has been laying down, not able to walk his entire life, I don't know how old he is, Scripture doesn't tell us, he calls him a man, so I imagine he's not too, fair, too fairly young. This man all of a sudden goes from not being able to walk, needing help for everything in his life. People probably look at him and say, oh, poor guy. To not only just standing up, but Scripture says he jumped up. How incredible. He jumps up and he starts walking around, and this person's life is completely changed because Paul decided to not stop at seeing the need, but he chose to meet it. What do you think the reaction is going to be from the people around him? Whoa. Whoa. This is different. This is something that we have never witnessed before. So let's keep reading. The craziest thing happens, right? The people think that Paul and Barnabas are actually gods, if you go on reading in that section. They think that they're their gods, right? Because they're not Jewish. They believe in, in Zeus and Hermes and those. 
And they say that Barnabas is Zeus and Paul is Hermes because he's the one that talks all the time. And I got to be real honest and pull out my old youth minister in me and say, I think about Star Wars when I read this. You know, where, where the Ewoks think that C-3PO is their god or something because he's shiny. And Han's like, come on, C-3PO, tell, a, tell him, you know, stop putting firewood under us. But this, this is so much more real than Star Wars. You have people who are looking at Paul and Barnabas who just simply want to go and meet needs in the name of Jesus and they turn around and they claim that they are gods in the flesh, Zeus and Hermes. That's what they are believing right now. And so Paul and Barnabas, we keep reading in verse 13, it goes as far as to say this, the priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. So, okay, it is a lot like that Star Wars scene. But... Paul and Barnabas are not okay with this because their reason for being there and their reason for meeting this man's needs and causing this miracle is not to get them to think that they are anything special. It's to get them to see Jesus, and they say so in verse 14. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd shouting, Friends! Did I read that right? Friends. Who are these people? They're not followers of Jesus yet. They're not Jews. They're strangers, really. And they run out, and the first thing that they shout to the crowd is friends. This is huge. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Ephesians 6.12 When we're in our community, when we're out of this space as a family at Shallow Road, do we view people like this? Do we remember that we're dealing with human beings? We remember this truth, that people have needs to be met, but they are not problems to be solved. People have needs to be met, but they are not problems to be solved. These people, while they really got it wrong with what Paul and Barnabas were trying to do, Paul and Barnabas remembered and recognized who they truly are. And that is human beings created in the image of God who need Jesus. Let's continue reading in verse 15. Friends, why are you doing this? We too are only human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Yet look at verse 17. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Here's the sad truth. When you begin to meet needs, it's not always going to go according to plan. It's not always going to go just as easily and as nicely as you would like it to. As you try to reach out to complete strangers and people in this world who need help, they may not always react the way that you would hope. But that didn't stop Paul. It didn't stop Paul from seeing the need and reaching out and meeting it. And the truth is, the, the, the craziest thing is that this isn't even the end of the story. See, they had trouble stopping them from, from making sacrifices, but then we keep reading in verse 19 and 20. Then some Jews 
right? They're trying to go after Paul, who is now a traitor and a heathen. Now, some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. Is that right? Iconium. That's wrong in my notes. And won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples, that is, the followers of Jesus that were there, had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. Paul understood something so crucial in this story and so crucial in our faith in Jesus. That meeting the needs of strangers is rarely convenient. Talk about an inconvenience, man. You just try to help somebody and then they stone you? Leave you for dead. Man, how things changed so quickly. And what does Paul do after he gets stoned? He just gets up, he goes back into the city, and says the next day he continued on his journey. Meeting the needs of strangers is rarely convenient. It often does not go the way that we plan. When we say that Shiloh Road exists to engage our neighbor, and we're accomplishing that purpose through seeing needs and meeting needs, we are talking about the people that are outside of this body. We are talking about the people that do not yet go to Shiloh and are not yet a part of our family. The people that don't think like us or dress like us or talk like us or act like us or think like us. The people for, you know, who for all worldly purposes and reasons should have nothing in common with us. Those are the people those are the people with needs to be met. Those are the people who are not problems to be solved, but humans to be loved. And those are the people with needs which are inconvenient to us if we try to meet them. The people that you know, and nobody else here does. The people who you see every single day as you go to school or to work, or as you interact with people out in the community. There are literally thousands, if not then hundreds, of those people in our midst every single day. The simple question is, are you willing to meet the needs you see? Am I willing to meet the needs that I see? Not just as individuals, but even collectively. Maybe we're willing, but if we're being honest with ourselves, we don't really know where to start. I think that's a fair statement, right? Because as we've said many times, it's, it's really easy for us to exalt Christ and encourage one another. But that third part of engaging our neighbor is very frightening. Because we're talking about strangers. We're talking about people we don't know. I don't know about y'all, but in, in my relationship with my wife, I'm the outgoing one. Kinsey doesn't do well with that whole, like, let's go talk to strangers, especially not in a big crowd. So I get it. There's plenty of us who this idea of going out and engaging our neighbor is the farthest thing from who we are as a person. So that's why I had... Wyatt read for us this morning from Romans. And I want to read from it again. Thank you so much, Wyatt. You did an excellent job, man. Let's read again from Romans chapter 12, verse 11 through 13. But I want to read it in the message version. I think it's pretty cool. It says, don't burn out. Don't burn out. Don't get tired of doing good. Keep on going. And it says, keep yourself fueled and aflame. Be alert servants of the master, cheerfully expectant cheerfully expectant of what? Opportunities. Don't quit in hard times. There we go. Pray all the harder. Help needy Christians, right? This is the encourage our one another part. 
And then it says, be inventive in hospitality. Be inventive. Like a kid playing with Legos. Creating a world, right? Sometimes the needs that need to be met can only be met by things that we haven't thought of yet. Be inventive. But be inventive in what? Hospitality. This is my favorite word in Scripture for the last number of years. And I'd like to share, you, share with you the actual word. It's this. It's called philoxenia. It means love of the stranger. We understand philo like Philadelphia. It's love. Xenia, you may understand that word, like xenophobia. The idea of being afraid of strangers or hating them. This is the opposite of that. This is philoxenia, love of the stranger. And that's what this scripture is talking about. That we as Christians ought to be the ones who are inventing new ways of loving the strangers in our midst. You know the sad reality? I think that the world's beating us in this area. I think there are people in this world who are doing a better job of loving strangers than often we are as Christians, myself included. Because the, the scariest part of this entire section here is that word. Stranger. What are we taught from a very young age about strangers? Don't talk to them. Stay away from them. And that's very, very good advice for a child. You know the sad reality? I don't know that that ever changes as we get older. At least not for most of us. If you're one of those people, you're not alone. This is not a bashing time. Scripture calls us to love the stranger a lot like this. On September 11th, 2001, after two planes flew into the World Trade Center and another hit the Pentagon, the Federal Aviation Administration closed U.S. airspaces. They said, close everything. Stop all the planes, land them somewhere else. They can't come here. It's too dangerous. And this made things extremely difficult for all the planes coming over across the seas and trying to get into America. They had to fly to the very first place that they could land safely. And the main place that most of them found was a small place in Newfoundland, Canada called Gander. Forbes put it this way. On September 11th, 2001, 6,595 passengers and crew from 38 flights landed in Gander, Newfoundland, a town with approximately 10,000 people. Almost doubled it in an instant. After going through Canadian customs, the passengers went to makeshift facilities that the town of Gander put together to help the strangers. However, within hours, the first sign arrived of how Canadians would treat the group of primarily American passengers left stranded by the world events. Americans Clark and Roxanne Loper, along with their newly adopted child, wandered through the local Lions Club, which was housing airline passengers. A Gander resident who Roxanne had never met asked if the couple needed a ride to the store. And since the luggage of her and other passengers remained on the plane, she welcomed the offer. At the store, Canadians asked if they were plain people and offered condolences once confirming they were Americans. Once back at the Lions Club, strangers asked Roxanne if she wanted to take a shower, even though there appeared to be no showers at the Lions Club. No, you can come to my home and shower, said the woman. Roxanne and Claire were grateful and accepted the offer. When Americans Lisa Sale and business associate Sarah Wood needed supplies, they went to Canadian Tire, a chain retail store which sells a variety of goods. When they rolled their well-packed cart to the front prepared to pay, the cashier asked if they were from the plains. Zalen Wood nodded, and the cashier announced that they could just take the items. She told them anything the stranded passengers needed the store was happy to provide. 
Other reports of businesses in town also chipped in to help passengers, including KFC, local subways, pizza shops, all of which sent food to help the stranded passengers. Local pharmacies supplied medicine to passengers who needed medication since many prescriptions were locked in luggage on the planes. Canadians didn't help only people. Local resident Bonnie Harris went into lower compartments of the planes to feed stranded pets. She convinced the authorities to place the pets in an empty airplane hangar, and she and others in town pitched in to care for the animals. Many in Gander opened their homes and gave passengers a place to sleep. The president of the local airport authority was surprised when he came home late and planned to sleep in the guest room so as to not disturb his wife. He was shocked to find an older woman who didn't, he didn't know already sleeping there. The townspeople helped children cope by organizing a large party, complete with games, a cake, and costumed characters. The store manager at the local Canadian Tire located toys at a warehouse and borrowed a fire truck to collect stuffed animals and other items to hand out to displaced children. One couple recalls carrying a child down the street when a Canadian woman ran out and just gave her a stroller. The principal opened the local school to stranded passengers to allow them to use computers to contact loved ones in America or elsewhere. Residents of the town stripped their beds of sheets and donated them to the local shelters. Denise Greyfelder, who worked at the Rockefeller Foundation, noticed the towels people donated for passengers. And she asked, how are they going to get those towels back? The woman looked at her as if it was an odd question and said, it doesn't matter. Greyfelder said that the selflessness of the townspeople gave her chills. Could you imagine if we as Shiloh Road took notice of the needs around us? The needs of complete strangers and chose to show hospitality, to love them, because the only difference between us and them is that they are not us yet. And this is what we're called to. By 2030, imagine if Shiloh lived out its vision of engaging our neighbor by seeing needs and meeting needs wherever they might be. No matter how inconvenient no matter how small, because we know that the little things become big things. And no matter who it is that's in need of help, because our battle is not against flesh and blood, and we have no human enemy on this earth. My encouragement to you today is simply this. Pray about this word, hospitality. Consider what it means to love the stranger wherever you're at with whatever you have. And my final word today is simply to start somewhere and start today. If you need help with that, that's why we're here. We want to encourage you to love others as you've been loved by God. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for Jesus. God, we thank you for his example and the examples of followers that came before us, like Paul and Barnabas, Lord, who saw needs and didn't stop there, but chose to meet them. God, we're even thankful for examples in this world of people who chose to love strangers, people they didn't even know, God. Father, help us, because often we don't know where to begin. But Father, help us to be inventive in hospitality. Father, we are so thankful for your Holy Spirit and for Jesus. Father, we ask your guidance this week. Help us to live this core value of Shiloh Road out, so that our church will be known in this community and abroad as a church that truly seeks to love our neighbor. We love you, Lord. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a need this morning. If, if any of you need to 
obey the gospel or if you simply need prayers, uh, we are here for you. There will be a number of shepherds in the back. Uh, we want to invite you to come, whatever your need may be, as we stand and as we sing.